Ask us questions. Thank you for that, Chair. Um, uh, Rhiannon, if it's okay, I'd like to turn to the uh, documentary, The School That Tried to End Racism. Uh, particularly interesting for me as it was in um, my my local authority. Um, Glenthorn High School is uh, just down the road from me. Um, the experiment that you did there, uh, which claimed to show that students exhibited unconscious bias despite the school being ethnically diverse and apparently well integrated, to what extent do you feel that the curriculum is uh, an important part of tackling this? Uh, but also what other aspects, such as the diversity of the teaching staff, are also important in terms of bringing that down? Yeah, so um, in that, in the documentary, so um, just for those who haven't seen it, essentially what we did was try to tackle or reduce unconscious bias in the class of 11 year olds at uh, Glenthorne School, which is an ethnically mixed South London school, which already, already has a very positive ethos around diversity, but was really keen to try and, and do more. Um, and basically what we did is over a three week period, we integrated a variety of different activities into the curriculum. Um, so these are things that took place as part of their regular lessons. Um, so activities included an unconscious bias test at the start, which was really um, to trigger or to sort of generate conversation around what unconscious bias is. Um, there was a history trip to the National Portrait Gallery where children got to see how black and minority ethnic individuals are underrepresented um, in the pictures in the gallery. And they had a discussion around, um, around slavery as well. They had activities where they explored empathy and perspective taking through discussing experiences of discrimination. They learned about white privilege. Um, they learned quite a lot about each other's backgrounds and identity. And they also um, had, at the end of the, the three weeks of activity, they had, they had a debate on whether the UK is a racist society. Another thing we did was use affinity groups, um, which were groups where we separated uh, children into their different ethnic groups to have conversations about race in a safe space. But then we brought them back together to share their thoughts and to actually have a kind of much more mixed conversation about their, their various experiences. So basically, um, what we found through the documentary is that after the three weeks of these activities, there was a significant reduction in unconscious bias. So the children no longer show the kind of pro-white bias on a measure of unconscious bias. But in addition to that, there was a lot that you could see, you know, anecdotally from just observing the children. So they had much greater confidence talking about race. They had a much greater understanding of race. So they you know, understood that it, it exists at an institutional level and it goes way beyond individual racist comments you, know, you, you could see them developing empathy towards one another they were much less anxious when they were all together and when they were discussing these topics so at the beginning they were really quite anxious and over time they became much more comfortable um, and as a result they just seemed much more bonded as a group and like they had really formed meaningful relationships with one another and there was really this kind of general feeling that from, that children from all backgrounds really felt empowered to work together to try and make a, a difference um, you know, particularly in terms of tackling the root causes of, of inequality, while recognising that the, the challenges, the huge challenges that exist there. Um, and to me, the fact that you could achieve this kind of change in, in just three weeks really did make me wonder what could be achieved if these types of activities were incorporated into different areas of the curriculum on an ongoing basis. Of course, I recognise it's a TV programme and it was very condensed. I'm not in any way suggesting that you could do something just like this um, on a daily basis, you know, where, where you have three weeks which are very much devoted to these topics. I realise there are other things, you know, that are parts of the curriculum as well. But I don't see any reason why these sorts of activities couldn't be embedded. Um, in terms of the, so the, the other part of the question was around, I think, um, having about increasing the number of staff from different backgrounds. Is that right? So, yeah, so... so... We, we spoke on obviously, but you, you mentioned the curriculum um, as being an important part to tackle that, but how much do you think there are other aspects such as diversity of teaching staff that also play a role as com compared to um, just changing the curriculum, for example? Uh, yes, I mean, I think, well, we've already talked a bit about teacher training and that's obviously really important. Um, I think diversity within teaching staff is really important because you know we've already talked about how the lack of representation in various you know areas of life uh, feeds into these unconscious biases. Um, so having diverse teaching staff, children can see in their school that their their, their teachers who are providing these, these these role model positions are you know are present for them. That's going to make a huge difference. 
And I think in terms of um, encouraging children to be able to have those difficult conversations around issues of diversity and race and racism, I think if you have teachers from a range of backgrounds facilitating those conversations, they're going to be more effective. And you know, if you just have some white teachers telling children what you know what sorts of conversations they should be having, so I do think it makes it makes a huge difference. But I would hope that you know if you were to make changes to the education system so that issues of diversity were taken you know, more seriously and were more embedded into the curriculum, that perhaps what you would see is that. Black, Asian, and minority ethnic uh, people are encouraged to come into teaching, you know, more because they can see that this is that there's a place for them there because this is something that's important within schools. Okay, thanks, thanks, Rihanna. Uh, you mentioned this the scene in the documentary there where you went to the National Portrait Gallery. Um, you, you've touched on the fact that um, not having uh, visible representation um, in uh, in somebody's real life. Um, uh, can Im can impact the way the way that they view um, view this topic. That that scene um, when you went to the portrait gallery and there and the students were talking about the lack of diversity perhaps amongst history, literature, and other curriculums. How much do you think that um, that visible representation has uh, has an impact on students from um, from diverse backgrounds? I think it has an enormous impact on a whole range of different factors. So we know that um, children's experience of discrimination and that le this lack of representation is part of that discrimination, not seeing yourselves in those positions is part of that. Um, discrimination has been shown to result in lower levels of self-esteem, higher levels of depression or anxiety, and increased risk of poor physical health, things like high blood pressure and heart disease later in life as well. And then thinking uh, specifically about educational attainment, perceptions of inequality among young people from minority groups predict disengagement from school. So, for example, there was a, a study just published this year, a longitudinal study, which showed that minority children who um, feel that their schools are, you know, are, are not supportive of equality and not supportive of multiculturalism are more likely or less likely to listen to their teachers. They're more likely to play truant, miss classes. They disengage. And, this really chimes with what uh, Jakob said earlier about the apathy that he felt studying history, that you think, if I'm, if I'm not part of this, why should I be paying attention to it? Why should, why should I be listening? And what the study also showed, though, is that this pattern was completely reversed when the schools were perceived to have a positive ethos around multiculturalism and equality. So if people perceive this, this to be kind of positive and their school to be really focusing on this, they actually engage much more. So it is really, really important. Okay, so yeah. if I could just interject there, I just yeah, I was gonna say, to say do you yeah, want to come in? I think Alicia yeah. wants to come in as well. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to interject that there was that similar issue in our school that when we did have a a working class Asian teacher, you saw that a lot of BAME students could relate to him, and when they were discussing those like behavioral issues, and he was sent by other teachers like, could you please go and do that? And they'd engage with him and they'd want to listen because they're able to connect on that level and there's just not that connection like in my school it's borders Hackney uh, and Islington and you know there's only one black teacher and I didn't know of her existence until this year and I'm in year 13 retaking and I didn't know that she was you know writing for the Guardian since 2003 so you know that really should put things into perspective as to you know there's a huge issue around staffing and I think that is something that really needs to be tackled thank you and Alicia, did you want to come in? Or oh, sorry, Elliot, did you want to ask something else? That's right. Some of the other witnesses wanted to come in and I have got a follow up. OK. Yeah, um, I was just going to add on. It's kind of a twofold process. So before I joined the Black Curriculum, I really wanted to be a teacher. I think it's one of the most admirable professions. Um, and up until last year, um, my aspirations kind of stayed the same. And then I began to think about my own education and experience. And I began to feel slightly uncomfortable teaching young people the same curriculum that had made me feel that none of my ancestors had ever done anything worthy of being in a, in a history book. Um, and I think a phrase or a saying that came out in light of the Black Lives Matter movement is you can't be what you can't see. Um, it's really, it's equally as important for black and non-black students to see teachers um, and to see black people in leadership roles, um, both in school and in the community. And I think if we were to diversify the teaching workforce more, we would see a lot of, a lot more black people 
um, and Asian people entering into the teaching profession. Uh, I think statistically, um, Black and Asian teachers feel a lot less supported, um, especially in outer city schools as well. Um, and a lot have faced racism themselves where they feel that the school or the higher kind of education sector just hasn't had the facilities to deal with it properly. So you'll find a higher rate of, of teachers leaving. Um, so I think it's really important if we want to diversify both our curriculum and our workforce, that we are inviting more black and Asian um, employees and, and teachers. Catherine, did you want to come in? I saw you um, waving your hand. Yeah, um, th thanks very much. I mean, I think, I think, uh, and this is coming back to history teaching in particular, um, and in a sense, we focused so far on the compulsory curriculum up to the end of key stage three. But as Jakob was saying, the, the issue is about if we want to diversify the teaching profession, it is about ensuring that students from BAME backgrounds uh, go into GCSE, go into A-level and go into undergraduate study and the Royal Historical Society's own report, um, you know, their proportion of um, BME students is about 11%, um, whereas as a, um, a proportion across all undergraduates, it's about 23%. So there are significantly fewer um, history graduates, um, you know, than there are BAME history graduates, that, that, than there are um, across all subjects. And, and there is a critical issue that we kind of lose if we just debate the national curriculum about the curriculum at GCSE and at A level. And um, although we've, you know, the Historical Association said we're, we're reluctant to, to embark on a whole scale um, national curriculum review, we think there are um, smaller changes that, that could be made to improve things. The issue about GCSEs and the current specifications, they are due for, for renewal. And there's a, a really serious concern because they do specify content really tightly. And it is those standard topics that are taught. So the Tudors, um, for example, very, very um, popular topic. And there is new scholarship. There's Miranda Kaufman's book, which has stimulated a lot of interest. And a lot of teachers now thinking about how can I change my key stage three curriculum um, in, in, in ways that integrate that history into the teaching there is currently no scope in in the specifications and and the exams that are set on that basis because they tend to be um quite narrowly political um questions um we haven't uh, you know looked at how to how to set different questions so i mean the historical association is working with the rhs and with ronnie mead trust um, and with the um, schools history project and with the institute of historical research to say together these are recommendations we would like to make to the exam boards about what they could do within the existing national criteria for GCSE. Mm. Um, but, but, you know, more needs to be done. That, that is due for renewal because it really, if we want to change um, those coming into the profession, it's really important they don't have Jakob's experience and say, I don't, I don't want to study that curriculum. I don't see that I fit there. And it does come back in part to, to the you know, scope for teacher teacher training when the um, national uh, when the GCSEs were last changed. Two exam boards did introduce units on migration, um, and they they could that could be could be studied as a thematic topic. Um, in some cases, they've also got you know empire units, or they linked migration and empire together. But because teachers were anxious, and because the changes were made in such a rush they opted for thematic studies that had previously been taught. So most of them, kind of 70%, went for history of medicine because that's long been taught and they felt secure in the resources. Whereas, you know, only 4% of, of students, uh, you know, in that first wave got to study those thematic um, units about, about migration to and from Britain or in some cases migration um, uh, to Britain. So, um, we definitely need to look at, at the curriculum further further up because that's that's a, a you know really serious issue if we want to um, diversify the profession and there that there are important issues to make those those courses more attractive. Which okay, is um, which I think leads us nicely to what um, I think Kim wants to come in and ask about. But I, did Esme, did you want to come in at that point? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I completely agree um, with what everyone's saying and that it, I think something that is really worth 
um, you know, making a point about is the role of the specification and what how the role that that plays in kind of keeping certain things um, out of the curriculum. So like teachers teach what they know and what they're comfortable with. And a large part of what they teach is based on, I mean, I know it was in my school and I know this is probably the case in a lot of grammar schools as well. Um, league tables are very important. So they teach what they know so they can get the best results and um, sort of have really high positions on the league tables. And so I think maybe there should be some kind of fail safe sort of built into the system where a teacher maybe has to go out of their comfort zone. So like, for example, for my English literature A-level, I was being taught Jane Eyre, Sense and Sensibility, and then a modern text by, a, like a contemporary text by an Irish author. So throughout my entire A-level and my entire school life, I never got to read a book with a person of color, like in the book. The only person, the only character I can think of is Bertha from Jane Eyre, and she's this crazed sort of abusive like wife or whatever so it's not a it's not a positive betrayal um so i think there should be some kind of um yes yeah, so, some, some kind of fail safe mechanism that means like three texts like that can't happen within the bounds of the curriculum because otherwise you can't i was sitting in that classroom sometimes just thinking like why am i even here i like this isn't inspiring to me at all uh, if i, I think that's interject, sorry i just want to say like it's interesting seeing Esme's uh, experience because she went to a grammar school, whereas I went to an all-boys state school. And there's a lot of things that I've observed. Firstly, I'd like to just mention on Catherine's point, where she's speaking about like further down the curriculum. When I spoke to a primary school head teacher in Richmond, he said that the only training that they get is in maths, English and science. And if that's the case, it's really showing us that our students don't really... They're not, they're not being taught to value history and world history and how we've come about as a civilization. And I think, you know, if we don't tackle that early on in school, then we're going to have that, that reoccurring issue later on at Key Stage 4 and Key Stage 5, where we are teaching BAME issues, but there are no BAME students being taught it at that point because they've all decided to drop out. Um, and then just leading on to that, you know, studying politics now in Key Stage 5, where I've had to, you know, go back a year and redo that. Other students aren't going to do that because they've spent 18 years disengaged with a curriculum where they don't want to spend another year in it. And I think that's a, that's, that's a huge issue. The fact that we're not being taught politics, economics, aspects of like feminism and things like that, that I'm taught now. If I'd known that earlier on in my school life, I would have had a way different perception of feminism and what it is. All I'd heard was gossip and, you know, what other boys thought feminism was. I was never taught it. And, you know, mm. if that's the case, me being in a boys' school, imagine in an all-white school where they don't have that interaction with other BAME students. They don't know the experiences. Yeah. yeah. Or, or it's a real lottery in terms of what experience, knowledge, background and interest the teacher might have that they can then give to the students, which has to be part of teaching, obviously, but it can't be left entirely to that. It has to be a fundamental part of the curriculum as well. I was going to bring Kim in, who I know has got some questions on this subject.